Today I want to speak on getting better at living for Jesus to the end. Getting better at Jesus for living, living for him all the way to the end. I think once in a while uh, it's good to specifically go to a text, but now I have the privilege of just like preaching the whole counsel of God, and now it naturally uh, comes up in one of the passages that I, we have yet to speak about, and that's the church at, at Thyatira. Uh, which we are in today, Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 uh, through 28. So I just want you to follow along, and then I'm going to give thanks, and then we'll be on our way with this passage. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 28. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write... The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. That's why I'm saying they're getting better. They're getting better. They are getting better at living for Jesus. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and is seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation. Instead of being spared, she will now fall under tribulation, the wrath of the Lamb. Unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches, not just these seven churches, but all the churches, there's more than these seven in John's day. All the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, that is, those words of sexual sexual immorality are probably, and the term Jezebel, are probably, some disagree, probably not referring to an actual lady in the church named Jezebel, Probably not referring to actual sexual immorality, but a kind of teaching that is adulterating the word of God in the church and leading people astray. It's the same language that's found in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, where God uses this sexual language to describe unfaithfulness to God in the heart. Clearly in verse 24, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching. So not everyone in the church was guilty of this. In fact, probably most uh, were not holding on to this teaching, just a few. So to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, it's a teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden but this, hold fast what you have until I come. Now that's important to keep in mind, until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end. You need to keep that in mind as well. Jesus comes at the end. Not at the beginning, but at the end. And we're going to learn at the end of what? To him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So clearly at the very beginning, his commendation is this. Your latter works, from verse 19, exceed the first. This church is getting better at living for Jesus to the end because he says in verse 25 and 26 keep doing this until I come or until the end and so I want to spend just a few moments with you encouraging you that I believe 
You are getting better and better at living for Jesus. Keep doing that until the end. So let's give thanks. And Lord, uh, over the next few moments, may your word be an encouragement to every single child of God in here who is holding fast to the gospel, getting better and better at what it means to hold fast to the gospel as we are going through trials and, like John said, in the tribulation. And we ask, ask Heavenly Father that by the end of our few moments on this subject this this morning, that when we go to prayer, it's not what I typically do, Lord, but you've laid it on my heart. I want to go, I want to lead our family in prayer. We need to pray that we would continue to become a church that's better and better at living for Jesus all the way to the end. Help us to see the fuller meaning of this and to be encouraged in our hearts, Lord, that what we are hearing in the church of Thyatira, Lord, you are saying it to us as well. You are getting better. Your works are better. They excel and exceed the former. In your name we pray. Amen. It's difficult to call my mom these days. Because the elephant in the room with regard to the phone call is that we're all hurting our family. So you just talk about weather. You talk about what's going on. How so-and-so? Oh, she's doing fine. And that goes on for about 10, 12 minutes. And for the last three weeks, it's starting to annoy me. to not talk about that. It's starting to annoy me so much that I'm getting angry. That we just can't talk about it or we're going to lose our emotions on the phone. And then you won't be able to talk and you just stand there and hear each other cry. So I've made up my mind. I am not going to call my mom, not one more time, until I am ready to cry with her. And to just bring it up. So yesterday afternoon, there we did it again, nearly 12, 13 minutes went by, and all we're talking about is the potatoes are in. Your daddy would be happy. Daddy would be happy. You see us get all those potatoes in. And the weather. West Virginia University is playing today. You're going to be able to watch it. All the chit chat. And I knew we're going to hang up again. This is it. And I said, no, no. And I had a line ready to go to just spit it out there. And after about five minutes of both of us blubbering, crying, sharing what we're feeling, especially my mom, um, sharing her fear of uh, being in the family room, and there's my dad's chair, being in the family room in the evening time. No problem during the day, but there's something about the evening time. My mom just doesn't want to be in the family room. She turns out all the lights. She gets her Bible, her brand new little kitten, her brand new little seven-week-old kitten. Gets her Bible, some books, some snacks. She goes back to the bedroom, turns the TV on, and she doesn't come out. After a little while, I was so encouraged and I began to express this to mom. You're doing it, mom. By God's grace, you're persevering. You're enduring. It's painful. It's scary. But she's making it. She's succeeding. 
I think often the devil wants us to get so focused upon our failures and our sins in this life that he wants to rob us of a truth that we all need to hear. Stan and Marcia, Jay, Jeff Nix, Larry Mintz not here, Nate, Bill Miles not here. Nate, you were, you definitely did not have that beard, not at age three. <laughs> You're making it. You're succeeding. You're surviving. You're persevering. You're enduring. I can look at each and every one of you, and I know a, a little bit about your life and what you've gone through. And you know what? Jesus says to you, I know your works, your love and faith, and service and patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first. You're getting better. Does that mean you're sinless? No. Does that mean you have things that you regret? No. Would that mean that you won't have any more massive failures, even possibly this week? No, that's not what that means. But what it does mean is this. Hold fast, verse 25, to what you have, and what you have is the gospel. You've got Christ, and you have not let him go. After all these years, after all these trials, after all this tribulation, after all this hostility coming at you from the world, flesh, and the devil, you are still holding on to Christ. Good job, GCC. That's what he's saying to this church. And that's what he's saying as he says the other things to all the churches. He's saying this too. Mom, you're making it. You're surviving. You're making it. Now, hold fast. In other words, keep going on. Don't stop that. And don't stop that until I come. Don't stop persevering until the end, which is the same thing. Because that's when I'm coming. At the end. And I want to show you that you are in a race, and after all these years, you need to get a picture of yourself. If you don't have it, get it. That you are persevering through tribulation. You're making it. It's not as if chapters 6, I mean chapters 4, all the way through chapter 20, have nothing to do with you and had nothing to do with the church. No, it's got everything to do with you. You are persevering. You're making it. Don't stop. You're getting better at living for Jesus. And you need to hear that. I need to hear that. Let me share a few things with you that I think will encourage you that you are persevering. You're making it. And therefore, good job. Keep on succeeding in this. There's a few things I want to share. Chapter 2 of this text he says, I know your love. And I think it's love for Jesus, love for the word, love for God's people, just as John said in his first epistle. It's faith. You're doing better at having faith. You're not totally giving up. You're not despairing the way you used to. You're getting better at increasing your faith. Your service. And maybe you're here today and Say, and this is going to actually help you to do better at love and faith and service. Your service toward the body of Christ and your patient endurance, your ability to endure and tolerate and, and just put up with the hostility in this life and endure and persevere. You're getting better, and if not better now, then get better. And that your latter works exceed the first. And that is to be a description of every single child of God. In other words... As the years go by, it should be said of you, it should be said of me, you're getting better at this. 
And you just have to ask yourself a question right now. Here's, here's a great place to just stop and make an application to our hearts. No matter where you are right now, is that what you once said about you from Jesus a year from now? You know what? You're getting better. Because your works today exceed those works a year ago. Is that what you want? Then there it is. You focus on love and faith and service and patient endurance. And that's what it means to fulfill verse 25. Holding fast what you have. And conquering. And keeping verse 26. Keeping the works of Jesus. And if so, then Jesus, the morning star of verse 28, Jesus is that morning star, you will get him, everything, and everything about him when he comes, that is to say, at the end. Now, let's take a few moments to look at a few passages because you need to understand what I believe what the Bible teaches of what is the end. Because if once you find out what the end is, then you'll know where you are. Right? Once you know what the end is, then you'll be able to see where you are in this journey of faith and persevering. I want you to look with me at Matthew chapter 24. We've looked at this a few times already, uh, but there's now something... Uh, Specific that I want your eyes on, that, that we need to see. Chapter 24, 24 verses 9 through 14. And, and right now what I'm going to do is just say this. I'd rather be, and I'm, my aim is to persuade you as well to be able to say this. I'd rather be left behind than taken. Yes, this is a massive reversal with what this country has been watching in movies with Alex Haley or reading in books in the Left Behind series, that that's a bad thing and I'm going to show you, no, you want to be left behind. You don't want to be taken. Is that what God's Word teaches? Chapter 24, verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Jesus is telling us to the church, the disciples, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the, will you say it with me, to the end. Okay, the end. And now remember what we just read. You got to hold fast to this, church, Thyatira. You got you to hold fast to this to the end. When I come, and Jesus says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Not taking the entire, entire the time to read all of it. Skip down to verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 28, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures, the buzzards, will gather. You need to just tuck that away because that's going to become important here in just a minute. And so when Jesus comes at the end, we see this remark, almost like a, an exclamation point, a refrain. There's something about at the end... When Jesus comes, that Jesus uses this metaphor, this picture of buzzards, of vultures coming down, and it's a metaphor descriptive of his wrath. So just keep that in mind, and I want to, I'll, I'll build on that, and I'll show you. Picking it up at verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, he, he wants to talk about this again, so he backs up. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They're going to mourn because it's His wrath, the judgment, the vultures are coming. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect, that's the church, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. 
And then he gives an example. We'll look at that later, but not now, about a fig tree starting in verse 32. Skip down to verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. As were the days of Noah, so will be the, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and, highlight that word, swept them all away. That phrase there, swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now here we go. What has historically in this country for the last 130 years been descriptive of, aha, now we know who's taken and who's left behind. And what we've been hearing in this country for the last 120 years, 120 plus years, through movies and preaching and teaching and books, is that uh, you want to be taken. You don't want to be left behind. And this event has always been described as taking place at the beginning of the tribulation, not at the end. Let's notice this. And what else Jesus says in Luke will be there in just a minute. He says, then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. And we were just told in verse 37 and 38 that when the judgment of God fell upon mankind, they were swept away. It's actually the same word. It's a parallel word. They were swept, and he swept them all away. And now we have here in verse 40, then two men will be in the field. One will be swept away, taken, and one left. Two women will be grinding at the meal. One will be swept away, taken. In other words, just as in the days of Noah, also when I come, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. And we can just stop right there and just simply ask the question. In the days of Noah, who was left and who was swept away? Who was left and who was taken into judgment? Yeah, see, it was Noah and his family.